ओके वी आर हम हम को क्या रिट वेट करना वी आर गोइंग लाइव नाउ ओके वी कैन इनिशिएट द प्रोग्राम एंड आई थिंक दैट द चेयर पर्सन ऑफ द फर्स्ट सेशन प्रोफेसर हिमंत जी लाहिडी विल बी जॉइनिंग हियर शॉर्टली सो प्लीज मौसम में मैडम यू जस्ट इनिशिएट द प्रोग्राम ओके सर आई एम नॉट प्रॉपर्ली ऑडिबल प्लीज रिपीट principal ma'am has joined welcome ma'am moshu madam aap please please uh, just switch on the video it's okay <coughs> welcome ma'am good very good evening thank you thank you yeah mushi madam please initiate the program okay oh, sir so okay. we'll joining shortly okay yes. okay sir now a very good evening to all uh, now on behalf of department of english kandiraj college i moshmi das the head of the department i'm pleased to announce that today uh we have arranged uh, in uh, in the one day international webinar uh, in collaboration with iqac of the institution and the title of our webinar is the dimensions of south asian literature uh, exploring science fiction and feminist narratives now at first i would like to invite dr shoma dattu the head of the institution and chief patron of the uh, webinar um, to deliver welcome address uh, to our honorable chairpersons and our eminent resource persons so over to you ma'am principal ma'am thank you good evening on behalf of kandiraj college murshidabad i Dr. Shoma Dutta, welcome you all to this one-day international webinar on dimensions of South Asian literature, exploring science fiction and feminist narratives, organized by the Department of English and IQAC of this college. it is a moment of extreme pleasure and pride for us to welcome honorable speakers who have graced us with their presence today we have with dr sabia hawk professor of english at khulna university dr mridul bor doloi professor of english at dibrugor university and dr shuparna banerji associate professor of english at texas state university as keynote speakers and dr himanth lahiri professor of english at netaji open university and ex professor of vardavan university as the resource person of the session on of this event i express my heartfelt gratitude gratitude to each one of the person of session for giving us their valuable time i also welcome all the professors students research scholars and the participants of this program at last but not the least 
I specially welcome and thankful to Mrs. Moshri Dhan, convener of this webinar, and the other faculty members of the Department of English, Kamdiraj College, Murshidabad, and the members of IQAC who have worked hard to make this event a great success. I am sure the webinar is going to be extremely enlightening and enriching experience for all of all us. Of us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for your warm welcome to our dignitaries. And again, I express my gratitude to you for without your support and motivation, it will remain impossible uh, for us to take such a venture. Now, we have uh, Professor Himadri Lahiri Vitash. Welcome, sir. Very good evening to you. Thank you very much and uh, glad to meet everybody. Savia, good afternoon. Go good evening, sorry. Good evening, Himadhuda. Good evening. Everybody, nice. good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Uh, uh, Totun, good evening from here, hmm. Professor Shuparno Banerjee. Hmm. Good evening. So, okay, uh, hmm. we have divided uh, the entire, entire uh, webinar into two sessions. In the first session, uh, we have with us Dr. Himadri Lahiri, the ex-professor of Department of English of Adwan University and Professor of English of Netaji Shubhashopan University uh, as the chairperson, honorable chairperson of the program. And uh, it is, uh, I'm very glad to inform you that uh, he is the author of two famous books. Uh, the first one is Asia Travels. Pan Asian Cultural Discourses and Diasporic Asian Literature in English. And another book written by Dr. Lahidi is Diaspora Theory and Transnationalism. Besides, uh, he has many other publications in internationally reputed journals. So, thank you, sir. Um, and in this session, uh, we have Professor Sabia Huck. As the keynote speaker, she is from Kulna University, Department of English in Bangladesh, and she takes interest in theater, translation, women's writing, and post-colonial literature. Her latest publication is The Mughal Aviary. Uh, women's writing in pre-modern India, right, ma'am? And uh, she is also a member of International Ibsen Committee, and uh, she has jointly edited Ibsen in the decolonized South Asian theater. And she is the executive editor of Dead Metaphor, a bilingual literary magazine. And the title of her talk is Beyond Western Feminism, English Fiction by Bangladeshi uh, Women. So I would like to hand over the session to our honorable chairperson, Dr. Himadri Lahiri. So over to you, sir. So we can't hear you. Himadri, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> I hope I can uh, you can hear me right now. Uh, 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 thank you so much. Uh, I am very happy that uh, I am here in a, the international uh, webinar, which uh, very well known speakers from different parts of the world have gathered, and we have interacted on various platforms at different times, and in a sense collaborated on certain projects. 
although not directly, not officially. Uh, I'm happy that uh, Professor Shabira Hawk is here. She has been introduced already. And uh, she is well known, uh, an Ibsen uh, specialist, as you have already heard. And uh, she, as I know, she has done a lot of work on Bangladeshi feminist writers and Bangladeshi writings in English. Uh, her writings are scattered in different journals. I've read some of them, obviously. And uh, the latest book, as you have already mentioned, is the Mughal Aviary, which is a different kind of a book altogether. I've not read the book, but uh, what I can gather from the preliminary information, this is the result of wonderful researches, researches of years. She can uh, uh, tell better about the book. Uh, I am uh, waiting to read the book, obviously, because the subject matter is so different and so unique. And uh, I'm here that she will be speaking on, uh, uh, the title is Beyond Western Feminism, uh, English Fiction by Bangladeshi Women. Uh, I won't uh, wait uh, much time. I won't stand between you and Professor Hawk. And I request her to start present. Uh, uh, she, 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 she should deliver, deliver her lecture immediately. Over to you, Shabia. Thank you so much, Imadrida. Am I yeah, Some kind of echo is coming. Anyway, I will um, share my uh, PowerPoint uh, after one minute. I would like to thank Himadrida, Professor Himadri Lahiri, for this very kind introduction. Uh, he is actually, um, I think he has exaggerated a little. I'm not <laughs> that kind of a renowned person as he presented me. Uh, but I have interest in, in women's writings, and that is uh, what has culminated. My interest has culminated in the uh, book he just mentioned. So it is. It was not my primary, you know, research area. It has developed uh, throughout the years of teaching and uh, learning. So I'm still a student of literature, and I try to learn uh, from whatever ages I can. And uh, this book, as Himadrida expected me to talk a, a little about this, I I would prefer to talk about this if anybody has questions in the QA session. Um, I would now uh, go straight to my uh, PowerPoint and I'll take, I think, a second to uh, share it with the audience. Do you see this? Not yet. Not yet. I'm not actually used to Google Meet much. Uh, I, it's coming, I think. Yes, it's there. Oh, it's okay, there. Great. But I can't see you people anymore. I'm more accustomed to <laughs> Zoom. And uh, this is the title of my talk today, Beyond Western Feminism. English fiction by Bangladeshi women. Well, I must, uh, at the outset, I must admit that I'm an avid reader of uh, science fiction as well. And I'm eagerly looking forward to the second session of today's seminar. Uh, by this, I have continued to dig out what I feel um, uh, women's writings should be uh, you know, brought into the forefront through yes. our research because, uh, like mainstream history, our literary research is also, uh, according to my understanding, a little biased. And women's writings have been, especially in, in South Asia, have not been taken up uh, rather seriously by academics. And I also plan to write on women's science fiction and perhaps that that is going to be, be my next project. But I need to explain the title a little. Uh, 
by using the word beyond, I do not mean to say that um, I want to show South Asian feminism as something uh, superior or I would uh, refuse to accept Western feminism. What I want to put forth is that uh, Western feminism has uh, some kind of contention with uh, phallogocentrism and Western feminists do not want to be, you know, uh, identified as related to men. Uh, where I find a basic difference between uh, the feminism in South Asia and feminism in the West. And my intention is uh, just to show uh, the specificities of certain feminist claims we can make through writings and women's writings become important for me. And for that, my specific objective is to talk about Bangladeshi women's writing in English. Um, and I want to claim that uh, the way we approach, by we, I, I don't mean to say I, I, I mean to say that Bangladeshi women, when they write in English, they approach gender um, majorly uh, from two perspectives. First of all, they try to make a connection to the geography uh, that uh, nurtures the quintessential womanhood of the characters uh, that kind of pop out uh, from a specific topography. And uh, secondly, I, I believe our religious identities uh, become very important and the religious identities of the female characters call for a fundamental difference in their approach to the, their struggle, if I want to call it feminist struggle. So the premises um, of my talk is that Western feminism as a modular form cannot be accepted and cannot be applied to all parts of the world, specifically not to our part of the world, to the global south. And when we talk about feminism, we need to have a rehash of Western feminism in analyzing uh, all kinds of fiction, including Bangla fiction. But today my talk will be limited to the English fiction by women writers from Bangladesh and how in their contextuality, they present a different kind of, um, you know, identif identification for the women characters, a different kind of recognition they claim for and uh, so Bangladeshi women's fiction according to me is a distinctive category and uh, that is you know results from their roots that are different and their gender consciousness uh, is of specifically I, I, I should call it uh, generically, it is of South Asian post-colonial construct and specifically of Bangladeshi uh, kind of uh, Muslim uh, identity uh, that has become a root to that, that kind of gender cons consciousness. And geographical and cultural nuances are obvious. Uh, when they use the um, language English, I would prefer to refer to uh, Toril Moi's idea that English, which I have in a slide here, uh, English as a you know male dominant, uh, uh, pre where the language prefers the maleness. So the use of English itself is a subver subversion of identity, according to me, and. Uh, the colonial language is used to talk back to the empire, of course. So that is uh, the, the basic idea I want to uh, share with you today. So I, I was uh, talking about Western feminism and its contention with uh, patriarchy, uh, where Western feminism uh, radically refuses to act as women uh, radically asks women not to act as women related to men so i have uh, here uh, 
referred to the second sex, there are many other writers following her who did not want to, you know, identify the characters as only daughters, sisters, wives, mothers, grandmothers, female uh, colleagues, etc. in the workplace. The ideal woman of the average Western male conception uh, comes uh, from this. Bouvard also talks about it, that men like uh, women who freely accepts domination, who a woman who doesn't accept ideas without discussion and refutation, of course, but finally she will yield to his argument. Uh, the woman who is intelligent, who will resist, but at the end she will accept and being convinced. So, uh, according to her, man's true victory, whether uh, he is a liberator or conqueror lies in this. We, we, a woman will recognize him as her destiny. And there are other premises of Western feminism, uh, like Helen Sigzu, who has uh, talked about uh, women's literary career and women's you know, uh, subversion um, as normal uh, human beings. Uh, that kind of uh, an identity is also uh, constructed through our English writings, but there are some differences that I want to talk about today. Uh, this is of particular importance in my understanding. And women must write. That is the idea. But in which tradition? The question lies there. How should women write? So. The language here, Toril Moi says that in, in English, whether we should write in English, uh, the idea of Toril Moi is, becomes important for me when she says English lexicon is a structure organized to glorify maleness and ignore or trivialize or derogate femaleness. So women, when they uh, take up the pen and uh, you know opt for writing in English, I think that is already a kind of subver subversion of gender identity, which becomes important for Bangladeshi women's English writing as well. So feminism in the third world has a difference. And the basic difference comes from the post-colonial identity, which uh, many like um, uh, Anya Lumba, Riti Lukos, they have um, professed that women in the third world, they are taken up as subjects who are ignorant, poor, uneducated, they're tradition bound, I mean, they are family oriented, and they're victimized, but they don't want uh, to rec recognize that kind of victimization. Uh, this kind of representation of women by the uh, Western scholars, feminist scholars, uh, lies in their Orientalist notion. And uh, Chandra Talpare Mohanty writes that this kind of self-representation of Western women as educated, modern, uh, in control over body and sexuality, freedom of self divisiveness, decisiveness, they have all these, and against which when they put our women as ignorant and victimized, uh, we need to talk back to that. So Bangladeshi women's writing, according to my understanding, uh, sprouts uh, from that kind of idea. And just to exemplify this, I have um, uh, short story by Nia Zaman at hand, uh, which is uh, a story about a widow, a grandma, actually, uh, when the story uh, is presented, she has become a grandmother and she is a, she has been widowed uh, in her youth, right after a few months of her marriage, she was widowed. Her husband was uh, an officer under the British Lord Shaheb. Uh, she went from this 
west side of Meghna. She, you know, Meghna is uh, around um, Chatpur, Kumilla. All these districts are on the west bank of Meghna. And she went to Delhi uh, from this west bank of Meghna. And after her, after her husband died, she had to come back to her parental uh, house. This uh, understanding of a woman in relation to the parental home is very important to me. So I think this story can be a representative of the all, all the writings uh, I'm going to refer to today. Uh, she is on will and she is enjoying unyielding freedom and power even after she has been widowed. She is using you know using all the traditional notions of a widow woman. Uh, she has enormous power because she is rich, her husband, and especially the necklace here is important because the necklace is gifted to her by her uh, stepmother-in-law. This is important. She is not only loyal to her dead husband, she is also loyal to her stepmother-in-law, which becomes a uh, uh, source of her strength and uh, she is followed by men in the village she does a lot of social charity and she has become the didima for all so this woman she finally dies when and when she dies she dies keeping her head um, high as the daughter of khan bahadur abdul mutin chodhuri who was the first Muslim graduate of Ampara. So this kind of, you know, uh, identity that comes, uh, the root of which is the family and the relations and social relations. This is what is the, you know, essence of our kind of feminism from this is not our weakness. This is our, our strength, according to my understanding of Bangladeshi feminism. So uh, I, I would refer to uh, these four writers, uh, Nia Zaman, who called herself an accidental feminist. And then I have on my list Tahmima Anam, who always preferred to write about women's issues, even though she was living far away from Bangladesh. She was never, uh, she never lost concern for Bangladeshi women. And her feminist intentions are her overriding intentions, which she has declared in her interviews. And the third woman writer is uh, Faiza Hasanat. Uh, she has a story collection titled The Bark Catcher and Other Stories. And here the fourth uh, writer is Farah Ghaznavi, who also has a, a volume of short stories to her credit. And she calls herself an unrepentant idealist. Uh, alongside these four women, if I have time, I will refer to a story by Shabnam Nadia, who is also an emerging writer. So Faiza Hasanat, Farah Ghaznavi and others they are emerging writers but their writings are very you know uh, very strongly uh, rooted into our kind of feminism so the first uh, novel i would refer to is nia zaman's the crooked neem tree where a uh, urdu speaking punjabi girl uh, she is brought up in dhaka and she is curious about Bengali culture. She wants to read Rabindranath. She wants to uh, hear uh, Rabindra Shankit. She is, she is interested in Jainul Abedin's paintings. And she loves to identify herself as, uh, the friend, so, uh, as a friend of the Bengalis. And her first lover was a non-Bengali, a Bihari uh, young man. Uh, who dies in, in the novel. And uh, finally, uh, in the wake of 1971, in the wake of the Liberation War, when her parents were moving uh, to West Pakistan from the East, she opted to marry her Bengali classmate, uh, 
and lover and she decides to stay so i um, i think this is something uh, very important uh, since uh, i'm quite fond of virginia woods idea uh, that a woman has no nation here i think uh, nia zaman subverts the, the notion that a woman does not only have a nation she can choose which nation she would like to belong to so this kind of category women's category was uh, uh, according to me it, it is missing in the western um, feminism and uh, finally when uh, the, the protagonist's name is seema when finally her husband her bengali husband uh, finds out that she had a non bengali lover before their marriage uh, she she is the one who says this that yes i loved him long ago ages and ages ago but you were my husband and i love you above everything in the world i'm sorry i lost the baby but some day we'll have another there is a miscarriage towards the end of the novel and this is the final word from the woman so she opts to stay with a man and she uh, you know this relation to the husband it doesn't weaken her identity it gives her the strength and she finally uh, is um, able to gather some agency and then the second novel near someone presented is titled the different sita where she has subverted the myth of ramayana sita is not rescued by rama it is again a story been, uh, about 1971 when the liberation war was uh, going on uh, this girl's name is sabina and sabina's husband is taken by the pakistani army she goes to the army camp and in exchange of her body she rescues her husband this is the story so when seema went to the camp this is her final realization sorry saida she this is her realization uh, she she feels that it is only in the fairy tales uh, draupadi's saris she is uh, referring to draupadi's sari here saris don't come off uh, the women and they are not saved it, it doesn't really happen in real life so in real life what happens the women can um, emerge as a strong uh, person who can rescue a man so this subversion of myth is important and uh, the new kind of woman i am not calling uh, them new women but new kind of feminists are emerging through such novels in the third novel uh, titled the barumashi tapes we find a different kind of a female protagonist a woman who is living in the village not very educated she is married to a man who goes abroad as a, a migrant worker to malaysia or some other country and there the woman is living in the village she is observing everything and she redefines her identity through her days spent with her in-laws this is some idea that through tradition one can emerge as an individual and this woman actually does so so she observes everything yeah. she looks at the women working in the village as in the cooperatives they are working together she yeah. observes her um sister in law who goes to the city to become a garments worker and she understands that women need to be strong and women have to stand up on their own and take uh, their they yeah. try to snatch their own rights so this kind of realization when it is coming from a specific class i understand that Nia Zaman is trying to integrate the whole of Bangladesh through this, and these women's journeys become the journey of Bangladesh as a fledgling nation, right 
from her uh, birth in 1971. So the first story is around 1970. The second comes uh, in 1971. The third one comes in the 1980s when Bangladeshi migrant workers were going you know, in huge numbers to Middle East and um, many other countries. So Nia Zaman is trying to capture that kind of historical development of women in Bangladesh. And my second author, Tahmima Anam, she starts from 1971. She starts with, um, you know, she goes back even, she goes to the partition of um, India in 1947. And she makes a woman uh, from uh, a non Bengali woman from Kolkata to come to Dhaka, because she is married to a Muslim uh, Bengali. Uh, this non Bengali woman, she starts living with her husband, she gives birth and she witnesses 1971. So this story uh, a Golden Age presents uh, the uh, story of Rihanna, the woman I was just referring to, and her two children. Her husband is dead. So the whole novel is written uh, in the form of uh, a kind of a monologue. She's talking to her dead husband. And she is giving every detail of the developments of their lives how the children are growing, how the 71 war has broken out, how she is trying to save her children, how she is praying to God to save the life of her own son. And she had a, a momentary, I, I, could, I shouldn't call it a lapse. She is not supposed to be loyal to the dead husband, but she is. And she had a momentary, you know, kind of a, lover for some days she gave shelter to a person in her house and she had some kind of affair with that man she also refers to that to the uh, dead husband and uh, finally she understands that she did not die in the beginning she wrote i have aged a thousand years i'm ugly and tired but i live and finally, she doesn't say so. So her story becomes a story of rebirth, according to me. And she's happy towards the end. She says that my son has survived. I should be happy. And my daughter uh, has not been raped. She has not been burned. So I'm, I should be, uh, I'm the, uh, one of the privileged, I, I should be. Uh, thankful. Uh, so from here, I think Anam emerges as a writer and she ends up through the different phases in the Bengal trilogy. She ends up here um, with the bones of grace when a woman is able to understand that uh, environment of a third world country is important and when she is going to Chittagong and uh, observing the ship breaking industry she also comments on the um, you know the garbage that is coming from the west and causing environmental issues in a third world country like Bangladesh so through her eyes we can trace through the eyes of this writer, we can trace the development of women's consciousness. And this conscience, consciousness never stops to relate itself to the men around it. And man-woman relationship comes to a mature phase here with this woman. Uh, she is uh, saying towards the end, uh, love for a man equal to a woman and working together, I had a periscope into life the vast and intimate sadness of it for the first time and that this is why I loved you because even the worst of the world was there to be discovered together shoulder to shoulder with you my beloved stranger she's writing this to Eliza Strong an American boy she was in love with 
though she did not marry him so this understanding is also something that makes her fundamentally different from uh, siri huspeth or or others who can write things like a summer without men these women never live without men and their uh, relation to men becomes their strength and tahmima anam's uh, latest novel the start of wife that has a few elements of science fiction in it uh, it is uh, going into a completely new world she hey. has entered the world of a uh, global corporate tech world where which is dominated by men taken by men and women's merit women's professionalism women's uh, you know scientific endeavors are exploited in this tech world according to her and she can when she uh, shows her protagonist marrying a british white and giving all her merits for having his claim uh, on the you know uh, the rewards it is her merit through which her husband claims the rewards she writes this i gave him all the privilege in the world so that he could turn around and mess me up this is i feel this is talking back to the empire of course she is not talking back to men she is also talking back to the you know uh, the west and uh, i think we have some time and i would refer to faiza hasanat she has presented us a wonderful short story volume where she has given eight different characters including one transgender character this story frank and frida is not from there i have taken this story from a recent a volume of short stories called our many longings edited by suhana manzoor uh, another woman uh, so uh, frank and frida i'll come to that later but the other eight stories by faiza hasana these are about uh, different female characters who are most of them are living abroad faiza hasana is trying to reflect on her own experiences in the us and she shows how women bengali women in diaspora they have carried forward this tradition of taking care of uh, family children husband in laws and through which they have emerged as um, female agency they have got their female agency in this story in this particular story a bangladeshi woman farida she becomes frida when she goes to the usa and uh, she becomes a wonder around um, her there are many uh, american white and black friends gather and they wonder at frida's kind she doesn't have a baggage she doesn't have a story to say here with this reference hasana is uh, trying to refer to the typical stories women carry forward in the west when they leave their home when they leave the third world they carry this kind of story in most of the cases these stories are real stories but how the west appreciates these stories this is what she has realized and farida or frida doesn't have such a story but she becomes an enigmatic kind of character to her uh, friends and she is followed by them so she becomes a leader according to uh, the story she is one who becomes an example and she becomes an enigma she is an entity that people wonder at people want to be like her and uh, then i would move forward to farah gusnavi farah gusnavi's women are also different she doesn't want to present women 
as weak, meek, having no agency. Her, her women are different. She de declared about it and she said that she picked uncommon characters. And this story, this story especially is uh, again a story who uh, which presents a woman who is rooted in his, in 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 her um, family and uh, patrilineal uh, relationships. The lineage uh, is her burden, and she knows that she cannot avoid it unless she becomes a professional, which is her struggle, and then. She becomes, uh, her father did not like her paintings in her childhood. He burned all her paintings one day. And that very day, she decided that she would pursue her dreams. She never painted again, but she became a scholar. She got a scholarship for studying architecture. She came to Dhaka alone from Chittagong. And by remaining loyal to the tradition she earned faith and she could live uh, her own life and finally she becomes one a master builder she becomes somebody who her parents proudly referred to uh, this kind of emergence of a female is something uh, that makes the story special to me. It is not a story of suffering, though it has a lot of suffering of other women characters. But this female, she has become a model for modern Bangladeshi women. And her kind of feminism is something that we can, in real life, we can witness in many women around us. So this kind of realistic presentation is what makes her different from from others but after all the discussions i want to say that is it like we have come far away from western feminism are we fundamentally different from western feminism i think i don't claim that i i believe that we have kind of internalized western feminism but we have uh, departed that as well we have taken uh, the good uh, elements from Western feminism and we have also uh, blended our good elements from our tradition into that. And that kind of makes it different, special and um, something specifically Bangladeshi. The last story, though I did not have the writer on the list, the last story, Eating Bone, is to uh, kind of bring uh, me to my conclusion. How we have, till now, we have carried the Western tradition. This story, Eating Bone, presents a woman who is unable to uh, produce a child. She is not very pretty. So her husband is going to uh, give her talak. She has understood that. And that day when she is uh, kind of sure that she is going to be divorced, she goes out, goes out to, uh, uh, to a restaurant. She buys a pack of fried chicken, roasted chicken, comes back to her, uh, to her apartment. And sitting on the bed naked, she starts eating the chicken and she chews the bones. So her husband enters, her husband comes to the door and looks at her awed and she did not cook anything. So it reminds me of the tradition of Purobi Bosu's, um, there, there is a Bangla story, Aurondhun, which was translated as Radha will not cook today. It has got some fame. So she, this woman, she did not cook anything for her husband. And she is eating the bones of the chicken when her husband enters. This story reminds me of uh, an American story by 
Charlotte Gilman. Uh, the yellow wallpaper in which uh, Gilman presents a character who has psychic issues and her husband the post uh, to avoid postpartum complexities her husband um, locks her in a kind of uh, room nursery uh, away from her kids uh, away from the family so this woman and disha the woman of eating bone they become the same so I think Shabnam Nadia tried to carry forward the Western tradition in this story too. And finally, I'd like to say that these writers uh, have kind of used English language by decolonizing it. And they wanted to show that a woman's identity in relation to men is not a crisis, rather it was a strength they made it their strength they have presented local issues and also their global concerns through their writings and as the western feminists count us the south asian or the global women from the third world uh, living an essentially truncated life i think these writers have kind of talked back to that idea that no our women do not essentially live a truncated life we have our own agency and we can um, express that through the language we speak uh, that is what i intended to talk about today and now i think uh, the time is for i would like to go back to you uh, thank you so much. I, I hope you can hear me. Mm. Thank you, Sabia, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, we have done justice to the title of your paper. Uh, you have really talked about Western, uh, how Bangladeshi writings in English by women go beyond Western feminism and Western feminism as a kind of paradigm has indeed a great, great impact on the erstwhile colonies. And uh, we are yet to get away from that kind of uh, influence even now. So it is a kind of a process to which the colonized women in uh, particular and colonized men as well are trying to move away from our historical bindings, psychological bindings, and this is reflected in the presentation very well. But the very word beyond is very important here in this particular context because what Sabia has uh, really underlined is that the trajectory of Bangladeshi feminism, as evident in uh, Bangladeshi writings in English by women, Bangladeshi women, uh, follows a different kind of a trajectory. Uh, you know that uh, fem feminist struggles in a different way, in very specific ways. Now, in the first part of the, her presentation, she had made it clear that uh, Bangladeshi women writers are trying to veer away from that overriding influence of the Western feminism. And here it is very important to remember that uh, uh, most of the writers who are writing in English, they belong to uh, upper middle class people, upper middle class, and many of them in every country, you know, are even elitist. They know their language, well, the English language very well, and many of them have metropolitan experiences. And therefore, you see, these are reflected in their writings as well. So when these writings are uh, uh, analyzed, you see 
we have to find to go deeper into uh, our analysis of the text we might find some kind of ambivalence as well uh, i think that might be a very important area for further exploration in detailed study uh, i will request those who are listening to the lecture to this particular lecture uh, uh, we'll take note of that and follow Bangladeshi writings and South Asian writings from that point of view. So when Sabia actually talks about specificity, uh, he, he not only uh, talked about geocultural specificity, but indeed talked about the location, the geographical location within the country, within Bangladesh itself, because there are many who belong to the rural Bangladesh. Uh, and therefore, that is a heavy chunk, uh, which also uh, gets reflected in the writings of some of the women writers, uh, Sabia has uh, talked about. Uh, religion, as she rightly points out, is a very important influence in the writings. And this marks Bangladeshi feminist writings in a very special mm -hmm. way, I would say. She has uh, then uh, followed four uh, very important writers, but we can say that they are the emerging writers. They are writing right now, and uh, they have the tradition behind them, and they have been influenced by them. Uh, you can easily remember Rokea's name. So Rokea is uh, a very important name which has inspired and motivated writers. And uh, but look here, the modern the writers who are writing now, uh, they also follow different kind of trajectory no, because they are located different no, places, no, 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 no. not only in Bangladesh but no, also no, no, in England no, no, no. and the US. So, so they are, uh, uh, their their uh, no, their no, representation no, no, no. is also no, no, no. colored by their own no, no, no. locations, no, no. their splits. Mm -hmm. Their locational splits, their linguistic splits, no, etc. Yeah, so, the kind of writing mm -hmm. that uh, English has produced mm -hmm. may be different <laughs> from the kinds of writing <laughs> Bengali writers, mm -hmm. uh, regional writers, Bengali <laughs> writers <laughs> are also <laughs> producing. <laughs> so, that may <laughs> be an interesting <laughs> area for uh, uh, analysis and research for the students, mm -hmm. the research scholars. Now, uh, you see, I also find another very important area which we might uh, uh, keep in mind and that is the generational aspect. When I said that uh, these are the emerging writers and uh, even younger writers are coming up, so generational aspects are very much present there. And when uh, we think about uh, Tamina Anam's book, Brick Lane, for example, there is a mother figure, there is a daughter figure, and how they, their interests converge in one area, uh, the freedom of women, but then they do not see eye to eye uh, about every problem that they face. They have differences of opinion as well. So generational aspect is very important, and uh, Sabiha has referred to Niazdaman's story. Niazdaman uh, an interesting aspect of Nia Zaman is that she is also a publisher. So she has been published and through publishing, uh, she is also a, a kind of a following a, a kind of activism as well. She speaks about, writes about, collects stories about Birangonas, for example, and uh, sufferings of the women uh, in Bangladesh. So publishing becomes a very important tool in the hands of the present-day uh, uh, feminist writers uh, themselves. And uh, so, as Sabia has really pointed out, the, uh, Bangladeshi feminism is rooted in the country, in the geography, in the variety of the English language, uh, uh, very localized kind of issues. Uh, these are all important things that make Bangladeshi writings in English separate from the Western feminist trajectories. So she rightly claims that uh, many of the Bangladeshi writers uh, conform to the uh, Western model to a certain extent, or this, they follow similar kinds of 
ideas, but even then they move away from them, they write from the, through the lens of uh, Bangladeshi uh, culture, Bangladeshi uh, tradition, and that's what makes uh, the, the, their writings very, very special. I think uh, it's a very important presentation and our students and our, uh, our colleagues may be, uh, I think, uh, very much benefited by the presentation. And uh, we have perhaps five minutes or so uh, if students or, or anybody else, those who are listening to the lecture, want to uh, uh, raise questions, they're most welcome, or even if they want to offer their comments, uh, they are very much welcome. So it's uh, the floor is open. Anybody? Questions or comments? <clears throat> because we'll move to the next session then. So I invite questions and commentaries. Are the students here, Imadrida? Are the students here? I I guess I don't see any students. Are they connected? Moshumi uh, can probably say that. Actually, uh, ma'am, uh, in this platform, they're not joining. They're joining on YouTube link. I see. Okay. I try to, as I, uh, since I knew that the students are the audience, so I try to make it as simple as possible. I did not to re I did not refer to Rokia or Rasundari Devi or Mahasetha Devi, who have been great influences on these writers. The and I uh, kind of left all the theoretical aspects that I have in my talk, just because I wanted to simplify for the students. So it would be very nice if I get feedback from the students if, if they are um, interested uh, and if they have any questions later, I'd be glad to address them. So we have a very, uh, uh, very interesting kind of uh, a picture of the Bangladeshi feminist uh, uh, movements and Bangladeshi feminist writing. That's, uh, that's really very good. So I appreciate this very much because not always do we get that kind of a picture. Okay. So, uh, so if there is no question, is there chat, in chat box or anything? There is a question from uh, a student, Aurik Chakraborty. Hmm. May I read the question, sir? Uh, please, uh, please, will you uh, will you read out the question? His question is: What is the difference between the English writings by women in India and that in Bangladesh? This is question from Aurik Chakravarti. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Aurik. I was expecting such a question. That is a very important question. Uh, in fact, I wanted to refer to uh, Anita Desai as well, uh, whose writings, I believe, are uh, not really much different from what Bangladeshi women have been writing. And Desai, as uh, an important pioneer in, in this uh, women's fiction in English. I think there is not really much difference in, uh, in terms of, you know, geographical or cultural aspects. But in religious aspects, Bangladeshi women's writing are much different from what Indian women have been writing, like Indhoti Roy or uh, you know, Anita Desai have been writing in a different way. Bangladeshi women, in, 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 it is particularly of importance. Religion is particularly of importance because, you know, religion tells women, I know Hinduism also tells so, but in Islam, there is particular teaching that women must take care of uh, their parents, their husband, their children. This kind of idea is kind of injected into women by patriarchy, by religion, and most of these women are, um, you know, following that kind of tradition that 
this is ordained by God that I should take care of my family okay, in good times, in uh, in a in problematic times. Whenever a woman is supposed to take care, and a woman is supposed to be responsible for children and adults as well. So this kind of idea is uh, what makes it different, according to me. I, if I could give solid examples, it would become more, uh, it would become clearer uh, to to the student. But uh, right now, I don't want to focus on writings of uh, Mahasheta, who has been a great influence, or uh, Nita Deshai, uh, who are pioneers for our women. Um, so my answer to this is, culturally, geographically, there is no not much difference. But when you are following the religious traditions in the writings of these women, I find great difference. Thank you, Savia. Is it time to uh, winding up this session? Yes, sir. We'd like to end the session here. Okay. Uh, because uh, the speaker of our second session has already joined. Uh, uh, and okay. uh, uh. So, thank, thank you, so Savia. Then uh, it has been so a wonderful much, presentation, and we have gained. I personally gained, and had a uh, have a very uh, a clear picture of the Bangladeshi scene today. Uh, because uh, we have heard about uh, some of the writers, emerging writers, but not that we have read everybody. Really, we got uh, privileged yeah. and enriched from her uh, lecture and your fine encapsulation, obviously. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Sabia, then. And I think thank we should wind up. So and, uh, thanks thanks uh, to Kandira College as well, the organizers. Thank you again, ma'am. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with this, uh, we should end the session, the first session here. And now let us move to the second session of the webinar. Uh, we have already with us the eminent resource person, Professor Mridul Bardoloi. And from Dibrugar University. Department of English. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. A good evening to you. Very good evening. Good, good evening, sir. Hello, sir. So nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sabia Haq as the honorable chairperson. And good evening, ma'am. We speak something about Professor Maidul Bordolui. His areas of interest include popular literature uh, and culture, film studies, uh, writings from Northeast India, and Indian writing in English, phenomenology, diaspora, et al. And he has published several articles in renowned journals and anthologized and co-edited books like Vibrant Use, English Social History, Flights of Fancy, at all and the title of his talk is dystopian imagination in select south asian fiction so welcome sir and i would like to hand over the session to our prestigious chairperson uh Sabiyo, madam madam it's over to you uh, thank you uh, madam um, i'm really glad that i have uh, been introduced to professor Mridul Bordoloi. Uh, from Assam, Dibrugar University. I heard so much about your university, sir, but I never had a chance to visit this. And I'm really interested to hear um, uh, on uh, yeah, dystopian imagination in contemporary South Asian science fiction. So the floor is yours, sir. I don't know much about you because I don't have your bio. Yes. So, uh, I, I would look forward to listening to you this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam. Uh, good evening to all distinguished participants of this international webinar organized by the Department of English under the 
uh, Kandiraj College under the aegis of IQAC uh, Kandiraj College, which is situated in Murshidabad. And I would like to thank the principal and chief patron, Dr. Soma Dutta, uh, the convener, head of the Department of English, uh, Ms. Mosumi Das, joint controller, Ms. Pioli Sarkar, uh, Department of English, for inviting me to deliver this talk on South Asian science fiction. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mr. Subhati Punar for you know corresponding with me and uh, you know sending me gentle reminders uh, and you know doing all the liaisoning works with such poise and grace. Uh, I welcome all participants and guest speakers as well as uh, distinguished chairpersons in the two sessions. Uh, I send my regards to uh, Professor Himadri Lahirisa who like uh, I happen to know quite well. And uh, in fact, you know, we are very close to one another and I respect him a lot. I respect his, uh, his, uh, his you know, professional and, uh, you know, uh, commitments as well as his credentials. Uh, yeah, I, I have titled my presentation as uh, Dystopian Imagination in Contemporary South Asian Science Fiction and uh, I actually made this presentation for the students uh, and uh, I hope the students will be present and here to interact with me uh, in the interactive sessions. So, uh, since there are two speakers in this session, I think that uh, I will restrict my presentations to about half an hour. Is that fine? It's okay, yes, please. Okay. So my presentation will endeavor to explore contemporary dystopian science fiction narratives in order to highlight various problematics of the post-human condition in which spaces that are once you know victims of western colonization and, and let's say imperial hegemony have been taken up i'd be particularly interested in reading uh, these narratives comprising of novels and short stories from across South Asia to explore metaphysical, geopolitical, identitarian, environmental, and ethical concerns. And I hope my presentation will be able to underscore uh, the dialogic or you know countervailing potential of South Asian science fiction as a genre that could be read to interrogate the dystopian condition engendered, you know, by the curse of the Anthropocene which uh, has ironically undermined uh, the regime of humans in the post-human condition. So uh, even though I have used the term Anthropocene, I don't want the term to be too theoretically uh, loaded and veering towards you know, the, I, the, the, the discourse of eco -criticism. I'm using the term Anthropocene in very broad terms. So uh, my presentation will focus upon dystopian or you know apocalyptic concerns that find ample resonance in sci-fi texts from india sri lanka pakistan and uh, a few other countries from south asia and uh, i will try to problematize all of this during the course of my discussion so south asian science fiction appears to be a form of mimicry in so far as it seems to appropriate the Western model of envisaging the post-human condition, which more often than not borders on the dystopian. However, as we know, the notion of mimicry involves both imitation as well as subversion. Therefore, any reading of South Asian science fiction would involve one underscoring the ambivalence or dialectical conversation with Western science fiction paradigms. So I think here, Amitabh Ghosh's The Calcutta Chromosome could be regarded as an important work in a field of South Asian science fiction in so far as this novel raises several interesting issues associated with you know, Western hegemonic practices, which you know, privileges certain modes of thought processes, for instance, rationality, logic, over others like you know magic mysticism or metaphysics western thought privileges scientific processes like 
empiricism, positivism over other processes, which are most pejoratively termed as uh, pseudosciences or proto-sciences, which are most often associated with the epistemological formation of non-Western spaces, including India or including the East in general. So I think the Calcutta chromosome offers a strident and devastating critic of the inadequacy of Western Enlightenment project, but also hints at how power relations uh, are responsible in silencing alternative modes of knowledge systems that are part of the epistemological accumulation of non-Western spaces. So in Amitabh Ghosh's context, uh, the non-Western space that he talks about is Calcutta in India of the 19th century. Even though the novel can be read as a science fiction, it offers opportunity for readers to explore colonial historiography, Eastern mysticism, the hegemony of Western sciences, the silencing of indigenous wisdom, among other very, very interesting tropes. The novel is dystopian in the sense that it anticipates a world order governed by principles that are imbricated upon the philosophical notion of you know, eternal return. I mean, that is a Nietzschean philosophical term, or in the Indian context, it is the cycle of reincarnation. Calcutta promotion happens to be, you know, a novel that is uh, that has been rather researched extensively. I would not like to delve deeper into it. The only reason that I mention this novel in passing is because I feel it's a science fiction uh, emerging from South Asia that has not succumbed to appropriating the Western science fiction template. Rather, it seamlessly succeeds in incorporating colonial history, mysticism, uh, the noir element, fantasy, and so forth to become a powerful historiographic metafiction that can be read from multiple trajectories. I think science fiction emerging from South Asia needs to have this defamiliarized dialogic character marking its sharp line of departure from the Western sci-fi paradigms. And uh, I'll, I think South Asia being a space that is situated in a global South and having a history that was uh, very much, you know, affected by colonialism and imperialism, thereby resulting in Frederick Jemison's contention of, I quote, all third world literature being essentially national allegories. I mean, it needs to memorialize its past in its narrative, even if these narratives are situated in a future. Hence, I feel South Asian science fiction needs to carve an identity of its own, which marks up its uh, difference. I'm using a word difference in the Derrida sense of the term from the Western sci-fi model. Tarun K. Saint, in his introduction to that collective Golan's book of South Asian science fiction, provides an important observation. He wonders whether, I quote, it might be possible to discern in the best science fiction produced in South Asia in recent times, the lineaments of an alternative, perhaps even a South Asian futurism, end quote. Taking this and other factors into consideration, I have prepared a tentative presentation right? uh, and I've titled it as Dystopian Imagination in Contemporary South Asian Science Fiction, in which I intend to read a few novels and short stories from South Asia by focusing on a host of issues, which according to Vandana Singh, uh, you know, sets up a spiral uh, of silence that has persisted till now. And, uh, you know, what it tries to do is that it tries to sort of fill the gap of the spiral of silence. And it tries to include certain, uh, let's say, problematical issues ranging from climate change to growing polarization and violence in society. So first, I shall explore Tarun K. Saint's dystopian short story. Uh, the title of the story is A Visit to Partition World. And uh, I'll also explore Sri Lankan writer Yudhanjaya Vizaratne's post-apocalyptic novel, The Inhuman Race, to raise certain phenomenological inquiries into what it is to be human. 
and what does consciousness mean and can machines with the capacity to show care for the other be regarded as human so uh tarun saints dystopian a visit to a partition world is a simulated hyper real revisiting of the partition trauma after 100 years that is in 2047 through multiple narratives the dystopia of partition is recreated through simulations of actual spaces of riots interspersed along the subcontinent's border uh, of you know of uh, let's say 1947 it is also recreated by deploying humanoid bots or you know humanoid robots programmed to reenact the partition mayhem performatively in a theme park named partition world which is modeled after disneyland this hyper real space that is termed as the partition world would be bolstered by an intertextual recreation of the originary moment of the riot and this asked in Visham Sani's partisan saga Tamas in a simulated environment peopled with characters from the novel, the most prominent being Nathu, the lead character from Visham Sahani's novel, whose inadvertent act triggers the Rawalpindi massacres of 1947. So according to the historian narrator in a novel named Gopal, uh, he says, I quote, the new theme park would allow one to enter recreated memories of the horrors of partition. It would in a way be a psychic re-engraving for visitors to relieve the reality of partition and its attendant trauma. The purpose of partition world was, I quote, to ensure that visitors had a near real-time experience of what their ancestors had gone through. So it was a process of memorialization of a traumatizing dystopian event from colonial period and its hyper real reenactment as a spectacle. There were, I quote, elaborate map projections that set out the geography of the partition world. There were clearly demarcative regions, Punjab, the Northwest frontier province, Balochistan, Sindh, Bengal, Silet, Assam, and the rest of the Northeast. Relieving moments before and after 1947 was an additional option. One could choose a timeline from 1940 onwards, leading up to the demarcation of borders by the Radcliffe Commission in mid-August 1947, or the timeline in the immediate aftermath. So in a way, it was something like, you know, a virtual reality game in which, you know, spectators uh, could play uh, a simulated role, either as victims or as perpetrators of the crimes, although in a simulated environment. Thus, the spectators had the option to customize their preference as far they wish. They could visit the spaces of their choice and relieve traumatic moments associated with these spaces, thereby experience catharsis or, you know, some form of psychic rehabilitation. Uh, now, perhaps if you come to the purpose of why the partition world was created, it may have been created in order to reinforce, you know, the politics of polarization or, you know, jingo jingoistic hyper-nationalist sentiments that was in vogue uh, in, in 2047, uh, the, the time in which this particular story is set. Therefore, the partition-themed hyperreal world comprised of you know, program bots whose functions were to recreate the dystopian partition horror. As the experience proves too immersive and traumatic to some characters, like the narrator historian Gopal, his wife Sneha, and son Deepak, they go into a catatonic trance and remains immobile when they're actually supposed to participate as characters in that in that simulated event. Thus, instead of you know playfully participating in the reenactment of the traumatizing moment, Gopal gets lost in a haze of memories. His son Deepak is horrified by you know simulated recreations of bloodlust, which he thinks could so easily spill over into actual violence. And his mother Sneha begins to fear 
for the safety of the humanite bot Natu, in whose eyes she can sense pure fear, or let's say pure human terror. So overcome with concern, she grabs the bot's hand and makes a run. The bot, perhaps not programmed to come into actual contact with humans, is unable to process this move, the alien touch and the movement. However, as he is also programmed to preserve himself from any external attacks, he follows suit, running after her to save his life or to save his uh, to save himself. The unusual activity of Sneha triggers a move on the part of the enemy sim bots that make them seek vengeance upon the family members who had attempted to save Nathur robot from getting lynched. So in the words of the technician narrator who implanted memories of partition time in the sim bots, I quote, he was still not quite sure about the ethics of endowing these humanoid bots with vivid memories that included so much trauma and violence. It meant that the degree of uncertainty had to be allowed for as the substratum of implanted memory was inherently unstable. He just hoped that the visitors would not extend their curiosity and voyeuristic propensities to the extent of wishing to reenact the worst episodes of violence. So like this particular character, Sneha, who also happened to be a clinical psychologist. Uh, she was too aware of the dang dangers of mob psychology. She knew that simulated bots running after Nathu bot uh, and, uh, and her were not going to let go of their prey so easily. In a way, they were programmed to exterminate their enemies. Sneha, despite knowing that Nathu was just a programmed robot, that is, was just a machine, wanted to protect him as the lines between reality and simulation had become rather blurred for her okay, after participating in that game. So her human act now posed clear and present danger for all of them as they were being you know, hunted. Since mob frenzy often leads to actions whose outcomes cannot be predicted, the artificial intelligence equipped symbots mob frenzy could lead to certain to, uh, sorry, uncertain or unpredictable results. As the mobs closed in on them, it was her son Deepak's presence of mind that averted a catastrophe from actually happening. There was every possibility of the three, that is Gopal, Sneha, and Deepak, becoming victims of bot lynching trigger, triggered by Sneha's inscrutable act. Deepak's pressing of the fail-safe button on his SIM pad freezes the bot's movement thereby averting a disaster. However, you know, Sneha, she feels that her act of protecting uh, the, the robot, that is Nathu bot, was worth all the trouble since she could see haptic emotions in the eyes of that robot. So extreme fear when it was being sent, or when it was, sorry, being pursued by the enemies, as well as a note of gratitude. That is when he was on the point of being rescued by Sneha. So such manifestations of effect on the part of a symbol was acquiring a dimension that went beyond programming. In a way, it perhaps suggested the possibility of bots acquiring the saliences of human, including real haptic emotions. So I think this uh, particular idea of, uh, of robots acquiring you know, sentient characteristics and experiencing real human effective capacities is an issue increasingly being discussed and debated in studies centering around post-humanism. Even though uh, the speech act theorist John Searle's uh, article, Mind, Brains, and Programs, is skeptical about you know, artificial intelligence equipped robots acquiring phenomenological intention or consciousness like humans and attempts to establish its veracity through his Chinese room experiment, there have also been, you know, critics like Robert Abelson, Ned Block, John C. Marshall, who have tried to explore the possibilities of computational machines acquiring human behavior as well as consciousnesses. The discourse of post-humanism is seriously examining and exploring these 
possibilities. I think South Asian science fiction writers also seem to be interested in exploring this ethical problematic or dilemma, and it finds a very, very uncanny expression in Sri Lankan uh, writer uh, Yudhanjaya, who is a Ratnesh novel, The Inhuman Race. So in this novel titled The Inhuman Race, uh, we understand or we get to know that it is uh, Sri Lanka in a post-apocalyptic period. And uh, like uh, in the novel, there is an attempt to raise certain very, very important ethical issues concerning like what it is to be human and, problem and problematizing the idea of humanity by raising certain queries like whether robots could be given the status human if they fulfill certain criteria and subsets supposed to be the particular preserve of humanity. So these philosophical questions are raised after a female robot begins to display the deepest human symptoms, despite not being programmed to behave like one. So in a post-apocalyptic British colonized space that we identify as Sri Lanka of the distant future, the distinction between humans and robots had become rather blurred. So as we read chapter one to chapter 12, we encounter two teenage kids. So they are referred to as silent girl and the boy is named the Pisa. They become fast friends and they stand by each other, you know, foraging for food, defending themselves from their opponents, and eventually, you know, getting exterminated by the state's security forces for alleged subversive behavior. The novel becomes interesting from chapter 13 onwards, as we get to know that these two kids were not actually humans, but artificial intelligence equipped humanoid bots. The regime had deployed these, I quote, as guinea pigs to locate flaws in a Colombo war zone, end quote. And the software in some of them did not get updated or erased of old memories. So as an inquiry committee headed by Dr. Kushlani D. Almeida is constituted to look into the matter of this bot's presence in candy, which was, of course, you know, off limits for non-humans, she finds certain characteristic traits in a silent girl bot, which appears very, very human. So rifling through video footages, she comes upon the final footage of the silent girl pleading for her life desperately. In another footage, she finds that the girl attempts to shield her friend, the pizza, from a rampaging mob. Dr. Almeida finds such effective behavior very, very difficult to explain. That is why she makes a strong case for consideration of such bots as humans. She feels that humans have invented such automated creatures for serving their utilitarian purposes of surveillance and reconnaissance, but they also use these for entertainment purpose, for blood sport, like the gladiators or slaves of the past. So the entertainment purpose involves creating bots programmed to kill others for sport and humans deriving fun at the expense of the machines. In the post-human condition where the lines between humans and robots are becoming more blurred, an alternative ethic of defining what makes one human has become an important philosophical question. Robert Foreman, he contends in his book that, I quote, consciousness itself is, or perhaps the only non-pluralistic feature of what it is to be human. If that is the defining shibboleth of being human, I think Vijayaratne's the inhuman race makes a strong case, a categorical imperative of sorts for consciousness equipped robots to be designated human, despite all arguments to the contrary. In the Anthropocene epoch, where there is increasing awareness about the pitfalls of the claims of modernity and attendant technological advancements, you know, sort of, you know, ironically turning human existence precarious, the ethics of humanity, including valorization of human emotions like love, care, 
responsibility, justice towards both human as well as non-human subject positions is very much needed. I think Tarun K. Sain's The Partition World and Yudhanjaya Vijayaratne's The Inhuman Race addresses these ethical concerns remarkably well. So echoing Vandana Singh's contention about a spiral of silence being conspicuous in South Asian fiction regarding certain themes that require urgent attention, Amitabh Ghosh in his nonfiction, The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, raised certain very, very pertinent questions. One of his most telling observations was his attempt at understanding why writers of fiction, especially from South Asia, did not engage with environmental issues to the extent that they should have. Ghosh also questioned why global warming and climate change were not interesting enough themes to wet the aesthetic imaginary of fiction writers. Despite telltale signs of the looming catastrophe confronting human civilization due to ecological crisis, everybody, including committed creative writers, seem to have turned a blind eye to it. So Ghosh acknowledged that he himself did not focus much on environmental issues in his past works. And he rationalized his neglect towards nature to humans' ideological indoctrination into what he termed as belief in uniformitarianism. This notion actually finds traction in Stephen J. Gauls and uh, theoretical distinction between what he termed as gradualism and catastrophism. So which are both you know, ant antithetical schools of thought and gradualism emphasizes on natural and slower process of change while you know, catastrophism underscores processes that were swift and cataclysmic, resulting in massive ruptures. So Ghosh's contention is that the culture of rationalization, which is very much compatible with the gradualist mentality, came to be endorsed by fiction writers in so far as it corresponded to banal, quotidian, bourgeois, everyday living. Therefore, realism came to be def they came to be the defining shibboleth of fictional writing and it went a long way in subsuming the improbable or the uncanny phenomenon of nature the regime of the belief in gradualism came to be so deeply entrenched in modern human consciousness that catastrophic pronouncements about the about the impending environmental crisis in a form of global warming and climate change were till recently assumed to be nothing more than improbable apocalyptic pronunciations or uh, let's say prognostications. Uh, and this particular idea finds resonance in, uh, in a text that I'm going to explore next. Uh, this is uh, Jayant Bill Narlikar's uh, short story, The Iceman Comet. Comet. Okay, so this story by the famous Indian astrophysicist, uh, like who played an instrumental role in popularizing uh, science fiction in India, examines the dystopian state of affairs which has been engendered by the curse of the Anthropocene. This futuristic story has a very, very, you know, uncanny premise. That is blitzing snowfall in the city of Mumbai. I mean, which is, you know, good enough to evoke extreme surprise because nobody in their wildest, I think, imagination of dreams can expect snowfall uh, in such a humid, tropical city like Bombay. However, that is exactly what was predicted by an Indian climatologist, Professor Basant Chitnis, okay, a fictional character in the story, Iceman Comet. And he predicted that, you know, there would be snowfall in Bombay within 10 years. However, his pr prediction turns out a reality in just five years. The way in which the narrative explains how climate change was triggered by you know, massive volcanic eruptions of Mount Vesuvius, which ejected particles into the atmosphere, thereby 
creating dust screens and absorbed or scattered sunlight will be understood by even you know, common layman readers. I mean, if you can uh, excuse the usages of this apparently, you know, is already term layman. So Narlikar's contribution to science fiction genre rests on explanation of complicated scientific processes in very, very simple language and lexicon. So coming back to the story, the dust screens absorbing or scattering the sun's rays neutralized the intensity of sun's rays from falling in places where it had used to do as a natural process. It resulted in the mercury dipping to unbelievable degrees, thereby precipitating snowfall in Mumbai. So the story takes, you know, pots such as those adopting the denialist position through Professor Vasan Chitnis's remark that, I quote, scientific theory of ice age predictions will be found more in the unpublished pile of his papers. It was due to the scientific community's propensity to valorize the so-called objectivity of the peer review system, or plainly because of professional jealousy or rivalry. In such a scenario, Professor Chitnis was dismissed as a catastrophist, and uh, they tried to suppress his findings. He had to water down his hypothesis, blur some predictions in order to get some of his ideas in print. So, despite climate change deniers, when the world becomes a freezing zone with half of the population killed by hypothermia, it is Professor Vasan's intervention through the operation code name Inv Invasion of Indra by effective global warming, by sending many rockets to penetrate the dust streams and warming up the atmosphere that the ice age that had set in begins to gradually thaw. So even though normalcy is restored and Mumbai is uh, restored to its former tropical condition, Professor Hassan feels that the invasion of Indra would effect some kind of collateral damage. He can already perceive the, uh, the artificial global warming melting polar snow caps and thereby unleashing tsunamis and cataclysmic floods in the near future. So this fear is what forms the discourse surrounding the Anthropocene, Anthropocene in the present and giant Narlikar's simple scientific, uh, not, not, sorry, uh, simple science fiction narrative imen, imagines the impending catastrophe in very, very lucid terms. So uh, I'd like to conclude my discussion. I hope uh, like I'm not sort of encroaching on the other speaker's time. Is it okay? Can I? Uh, no, no, not no, that. We can conclude now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'll just conclude. So the concluding science fiction narrative that I'm going to take up is Pakistani writer, writer. Asif Aslam Farooqi's Urdu short story. The title of that story is Samandar Ki Chori, and which has been translated by Said Nagvi as Stealing the Sea. So in extending my discussion on the Anthropocene, when there are you know, geopolitical factors that need to be taken into consideration. For instance, you know, sharing and seizing of resources, both natural and artificial. And uh, Faruqi's story hints at such a possibility, but without, you know, spelling it out in very clear terms. The story, Samandar Ki Chori, is a satirical existentialist account of a sea being stolen without anyone's awareness. It's a speculative fiction on how the disappearance of a sea becomes the subject of intense discussion on the part of city dwellers in what is evidently Karachi in Pakistan. The subject of the sea's disappearance is taken up by people across race and across communities and class lines, producing a Babelian polyphonic conversation in which logical claims are subverted by credulous metaphysical claims. The scientific is counteracted by pseudoscience rhetoric. So several conspiracy theories abound with, you know, land grabbers and bureaucrats, rulers, mullahs, etc., being separately held accountable for the stealing of the sea. The story raises some fundamental questions pertaining to the loss of ecological balance, loss of livelihood of fishermen, 
the street food vendors, etc. But it also shows clearly the lackadaisical attitude on part of the city's denizens who are content more in memorializing the beach's disappearance through candlelit vessels, nostalgically recounting happier times when the sea was there or participating in community prayers. In a way, the apathy shown by the people would also imply the lack or loss of moral compass engendered by their greed or their selfishness or poverty. Even though the story appears to be a fable on the curse of the Anthropocene, which has wrought devastation upon nature, the story could also be interpreted as a cautionary tale of the perils of powerful nations' geopolitical designs, which could result in stealing resources like land, water, etc., to serve their ulterior motives. The idea of the sea getting stolen is no longer a figment of speculative imagination, but it's becoming more and more a reality. The construction of, for instance, captive dams in strategic places by powerful nations or conglomerates can actually make waters dry up completely in certain targeted spaces. So it will be tantamount to stealing the sea. Here, the fate of nations would depend on the power that it is able to exert physically, ideologically, or you know, stro strategic geopolitical alliance and counter alliance. So biopower or bioterrorism can be pursued so subtly and surreptitiously that ordinary people's reactions would not perhaps be any different to the characters inhabiting Haruki's narrative. This is a rather chilling notion that gets in underscored in Asif Aslam Haruki's Samundar Kids story. And uh, to conclude my discussion, it can be said that South Asian science fiction is gaining traction and it has been able to make its presence felt among readers and critics. A number of writers like you know, Samit Basu, Bal Ponke, Vandana Singh, uh, Rukmini Bhaya Nair, Manjula Padmanabhan, Anil Menon, Usman P. Malik, Bina Sa, Vajra, Sandra Sekara, Saad Jeff Payne, and many others are, you know, experimenting on the level of both form and content and coming out with very, very you know, interesting stories while adhering to the dominant Western template. And they have also been able to curve their distinctive identity in terms of exploring issues that play their own reason, attempting, attempting to tackle issues associated with their distinct spatiality. It can be said with certainty that science fiction narratives with uh, will dominate the creative imagination of South Asian writers uh, with a spurt in technological advances. And I think the future of this genre appears to be very bright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to interfere here, ma'am. Uh, with yes, your please. permission, with your kind permission. Uh, would like to place our question and answer session uh, at the end of second lecture as we are eagerly waiting for uh, our supernova energies lecture and please do uh, the encapsulation of Bordeaux Arts lecture at the end of supernova Science lecture sure and i would ask you to uh, say a few words about professor suborno Banerjee because i was not yeah. given his bio yeah. as well yes, so please. please go on please. now it's a great pleasure to me to greet uh, professor suparno energy who is an associate professor uh, from texas uh, state university department of english and uh, he is the keynote speaker of our uh, second uh, second session. Dr. Suparna Energy has specialization uh, in science fiction, utopian, and post-colonial studies. He is the author of Indian Science Fiction, Patterns, History, and Hybridity. Apart from the, uh, this, his scholarship has also appeared in many academic journals, including Science Fiction Studies, Journal of the Fantastic in, uh, in Arts, Extrapolation, and South Asian Popular Culture. And in such anthologies 
as science fiction, imperialism, and the third world. These orienting planets, racial representations of Asia in science fiction, the Rutledge companion to cyberpunk culture, and science fiction in translation. And the title of his talk is Local, Global, and National, an Examination of Transmission and Translation of Indian Science Fiction. So I would like to request you, madam, uh, to hand over, uh, I'm handing over the session to you. Uh, Professor Banerjee, I think the floor is yours. I have nothing to say at this moment. Please come forward and present uh, your paper on local, global, and national, an examination of transmission and translation of Indian science fiction. Very much looking forward to hearing to you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introductions. And am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you are. So again, I um, thank all the organizers of this webinar for inviting me here to speak. And I also highly appreciate the insightful talks of my esteemed colleagues and chairpersons. Um, my, my discussion differs a little bit from the previous ones in that, that mine does not really have any specific textual, close textual analysis, but I'm rather taking overall an overall look at the way that I, th I think at least the way um, Indian science fiction I'm kind of focusing on that and that's my primary area of interest gets across the various borders is read globally as well as locally and nationally because I do see differences amongst all those things and this paper um, emerges out of many of the issues that I noticed while writing the book um, Indian Science Fiction Patterns History of Hybridity that came out in 2020. So it's kind of a continuation of an already existing project. I'm going to share a PowerPoint here just to um, refer to specific books so that we can have it in front of us. Okay, so I'll just go directly into my um, talk. In the last few years, at least four English language anthologies of Indian science fiction have come out. I'll refer to science fiction as SF as I go along. Avatar, Contemporary Indian Science Fiction, 2019, edited by Tarun Kesant and Francesco Verso, contains only contemporary English language SF, Strange Worlds, Strange Times, Amazing Sci-Fi Stories, published 2018, edited by Vinayak Verma, mostly includes SF in Indian English. And although the two volume, The Galan's Book of South Asian Science Fiction, published in 2019 and 2021, edited by Saint, is more ambitious in scope, only 14 out of 60 entries in the volume are non-Indian, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Tibet. The latter three books, however, exhibit a willingness to engage with the wider Indian or South Asian SF scene that includes writers in English as well as in indigenous languages, including domestic and diasporic authors. Although both all, rather, all books primarily consist of Indian English SF, a few works in translation have found their way in. In Strange Worlds, there is one in Bangla, while the Golan's books include eight, four Bangla, two Hindi, and one each of Marathi and Urdu. I think I'm counting them right, maybe. Um, no, I, th I think I'm pretty much sure about the numbers here. In addition, Saint's introduction to both the volumes of the Galan's book draws conscious connections among many SF traditions existing in South Asia since the 19th century without showing any ideological preference for one over another. 
Even though such publication seen does not do proper justice to indigenous language SF as Balpon case, it happened tomorrow, published in 1993, attempted to do, these works lead me to contend that larger connections and patterns exist among many SF traditions of India and that examining such larger patterns generates a complex yet identifiably unique national tradition and that bridging the boundaries among such traditions through translation is necessary to create awareness of these larger patterns as well as effective dissemination of Indian SF to a global readership. While the second task may benefit from English translation of indigenous language SF, the, the first task may still require translations among the languages of India, which is probably more problematic. One issue that these anthologies highlight is a much debated one in Indian literature in general, the preferential treatment of English language works over indigenous language literature, often termed Bhasha literature, at the national and international level. Boni Zare and Nalini Ayar argue that a complex nexus of Western media politics, elitist bias and ignorance, global marketing and publishing policies, as well as a certain degree of colonial mentality, create an unequal playing field that benefits English language works at the expense of Pasha literature. Zari and Ayar mentions V.S. Naipaul and Salman Rushdie's belittling attitude towards and ignorance of Indian Bhasha literature while purportedly being experts on Indian literature at the global scene to illustrate this problem. While SF as a genre exists on the borders of both mainstream Bhasha as well as mainstream English language literature in India, similar situations often crop up from exactly the same reasons. The above mentioned anthologies highlight this problem. While the Golan's books are undoubtedly a praiseworthy effort and have received welcome attention globally, the same amount of awareness is hardly allotted to the Bangla web magazine Kalpo Bishro that is pursuing an equally worthy cause. Although that is changing, I should say. <clears throat> the same can be said of other Bhasha SF anthologies. Anish Deb's Onish Deb edited Shera Kalpo Biggan, published in 1991 and thereafter multiple reprints in Bangla. And the two volume Hindi anthology Bharatiya Biggan Kathai, originally published in early 2000s and has multiple reprints, edited by Shukde Prasad, come to mind among others that have tried to bring together several strands of Indian SF. Such efforts remain largely underappreciated. In Western academia, Bhasha SF has found mention relatively recently, such as in Hans Hardaran Marathi SF, Pablo Mukherjee, Devjani Shengupto, Bodhisattva Chattopadhyay, and Onnesha Maiti, among other, on Bangla SF, Sami Ahmed Khan on Hindi SF, Amy Rens Ransom and Jessica Langer on Hindi SF films, and some of my own works on Bangla, Assamese, Hindi, Marathi, and Tamil SF. In such journals as Science Fiction Studies, Foundation, Extrapolation, Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts, Postcolonial Studies, as well as in critical anthologies, um, publication on Indian English SF far outnumbers that on Bhasha SF. Thus, Indian SF for the global audience primarily remains Indian English SF by the Indian diaspora and domestic writers. Although some critical works on Bhasha SF exist in India, they are either often scantily researched or journalistic in nature or published in Bhasha outlets. Robin Ball's Banglai Biggan Chorcha, published in 1997, is a good example, as are some of Siddhartha Ghosh's articles in Bangla and Arvind Mishra's blog posts in Hindi. They all deal with Bhasha SF, but has not found that big of an exposure. While the first kind is only good as a starting point, the second kind lacks audience exposure at the national or global level. 
Therefore, the importance of an anthology like Golan's, the Golan's book needs to be underscored. Despite their tilt towards English, they try to indicate the existence of a completely unexplored territory of Indian SF for the global audience. Not only through the token inclusion of translated SF, but also through Saint's very important introductions that engage with the larger Bhasha SF scene in India and South Asia like our previous speaker rightly mentioned. In this context, I should clarify that these are not the only English translations of Bhasha Yosef. Others exist, but less readily available than these to the global reading public. The domestic public, uh, sorry, the domestic publication scenario though is even more complex than it appears. In addition to the problems mentioned by Zare and IR, first language bias is an aspect that often gets overlooked. By first language, I denote either the language in which a work is originally published or the first language of the editor. Like the Golan's books focus on English language SF, the Bhasha anthologies mentioned above focus mostly on Bangla, the one edited by Deb, and Hindi the one edited by Prasad. Even It Happened Tomorrow, which consisted mostly of translated works, shows a bias towards Marathi, the language of the editor Bal Pundke. Even my own investigations into science fiction, despite my conscious effort to be inclusive, are biased towards Bangla, my first language, and English, my second, and a lot, comparatively less space to other Indian languages. The same is largely true for the scholars mentioned above. Such first language bias seem not to stem only from linguistic attachment of the scholars, editors, or publishers, but also from the near impossibility of comparatively knowing every Bhasha literature seen in India. Thus, more publication, translation, and scholarship on individual Bhasha SF and its dissemination across linguistic lines is necessary. Maybe following the model of Shaito Academy, Shaito Academy's Encyclopedia of Indian Literature, a compendium work of Indian SF will be produced sometime soon. If English proves to be medium to serve such a purpose, so be it. Such works can then be translated into other Indian languages. In fact, National Book Trust has already engaged in such efforts following which it happened tomorrow, the one that I mentioned earlier, was translated into other Indian languages such as Hindi and Bangla. The same has been done. So these, so these are like it happened tomorrow and the cover of the Bangla translation of this, the same book. The same has been done with A.K. Ramanujan and edited Folk Tales of India in 1998 and more recently in 2021, Arvind Mishra's Hindi language SF has been published in English as the Space Kaku and other stories to surmount the language barrier. And Shukana Dotto's English language SF went in the other direction earlier for easy accessibility to Hindi readers, as did Lokhinandan Bora's Assamese science fiction. So these things are being done. It's not like that they have not been done. In this context, I again highlight India's linguistic diversity and the problems any concept of Indian literature creates. Shaito Academy recognizes 24 languages for reasons of their significance in literature. Among them are Assamese, Bengali, Boro, Dogri, English, Gujarati, Hindi, Kannar, Kashmiri, Konkani, Maithili, Malayalam, Manipuri, Marathi, Nepali, Uriya, Punjabi, Rajasthani, Sanskrit, Santali, Sindhi, Tamil, Telugu, and Urdu. And many of these actually have science fiction traditions. The presence of this diversity is nothing short of staggering. It is quite understandable why the very concept of national literature, as sometimes understood in the West, is problematic when applied to India. However, there is always a tendency to homogenize this multiplicity into the concept of unity in diversity. As Omiyo Dev argues, 
such an approach underlies the motto of Shaito Academy. Indian literature is one, though written in many languages. This perspective, though, is opposed by scholars who argue that a country where so many languages coexist should be understood as a country with literatures in the plural. Dave argues for a better understanding of the differences that exist between the literatures and cultures of India and the prioritization of their cultural independence. Citing Guru Bhagat Singh's concept of differential multilogue, Dave argues for a system in which literary conversation happens from multiple angles and in a non-centralized manner. Dave thus um, practically rejects the notion of a national literature, especially something that is written either in English, which displays residual colonial agendas, or something that comes with underpinnings of nationalist ideology, as can be seen in the imposition of Hindi. To, pat to see patterns and connections, though, one does not need to subscribe to a nationalist ideology or even call for a homogenization through translation. Like Dev, Ajaz Ahmad questions the very existence of a monolithic structure of Indian literature. However, he points out that the unity of Indian literatures is not in the form of linguistic homogeneity. Rather, it is an unity in the historical and civilizational sense. Although what such civilizational unity is can be brought to question existence of cultural cross-pollination not bound by linguistic lines in the productions of the subcontinent that Ahmad hints at can hardly be doubted. Rabindranath Tagore's advocacy of English education came with similar ideas in the earlier part of 20th century. In fact, Tagore emphasized these close encounters not only among Bhasha cultures but also between India and the West. Although he did not specifically formulate anything like Goethe's wealth literature, he stressed the need for cultural interaction in order to gain a broader perspective of the world. According to Amartya Sen, Tagore's idea of cultural interaction was broader than Goethe's. Tagore wanted to bring together the best of both worlds, the Orient and the Occident, to broaden human perception. He was keenly aware of his Indian heritage, yet acknowledged the need to understand the West. For Tagore, English provided a window to the West and effectively to the world. He emphasized the importance of English education even at the height of the Indian independence movement. While he criticized the British colonial government and rejected his knighthood, he did not oppose the cultural interaction with the English. His critique of the Indian nationalist movement was its blindness to the benefits of a contact with another civilization. Indian SF is a result of this kind of encounter between India and the West. Consequently, the debate over the position of English and Bhasha literature in its corpus is not only evident in its publication and dissemination politics, but also in the larger thematic patterns. While discussing those patterns is not within the scope of this talk, I can assert that despite having their own language and culture specific attributes, Indian SF traditions have displayed shared qualities throughout their histories. A more active translation culture is bound to create awareness of these patterns, similarities and differences among these traditions and may dispel misconceptions across the language divide, both nationally and globally. So, in a, in a sense, works like, like these are performing such tasks as are works such as these. Mishra's preface in Space Kaku, for example, claims that Indian SF stories have optimistic ending in contrast to Western SF's pessimism. The reality of S Indian SF does not bear out such a statement, as is proven by the previous speaker. Such misunderstanding occur out of the lack of exposure to other SF traditions. Similar perceptions regarding Indian SF may logically exist outside of India. 
especially now, that a number of Indian English SF works, both creative and scholarly, have been nominated for and received prestigious international SF awards. S.P. Divya's recent novel Machinehood um, is an excellent example of that. However, like Mishra's and Saint's efforts to translate Bhasha SF into English, other initiatives such as Kalpabisha's inclusion of a number of English translations of Bangla SF in their bilingual annual Puja Varshiki issue, um, translating Hindi SF into Bangla in Mrittu Debota O Onnannu in 2022, and inclusion of translated SF in the Bangla anthology of SF written by Indian women, Konka Bhuti Kalpabigyan Lekhenni, edited by Omkita, Joshodara Rai Choudhury, and Deep Kosh, published 2021, is laudable as is the series of books on Tamil pulp fiction, including SF, translated into English, um, published by Luft. Recent trend in scholarship on Indian SF is also notable in this regard. The last couple of years have seen publication of four book-length studies and at least one anthology of critical works on Indian SF. Here we start seeing some changes in the scenario. Rithik Bhattacharji and Sheta Khilnani's anthology, Science Fiction in India 2022, contains essays mostly on Indian English SF, but also few, also a few on Bhasha SF. Sami Ahmed Khan's Star Warriors of the Modern Raj, published 2021, 20, is focused on Indian English SF. Urvashi Kuad's Science Fiction and Indian Women Writers, published 21, mainly discusses English SF, but with some account of Hindi SF. Pablo Bumannu Mukherjee's Final Frontiers, published 2020, is primarily focused on Bengali SF while briefly touching upon some English language SF. And my own Indian Science Fiction, published 2020, has an openly multilingual approach. Such efforts of translation and scholarly foregrounding of the multilingual aspect of Indian SF, lo both locally as well as at the global level, needs to happen for the world to engage with Indian SF in a more meaningful manner. Perhaps the best example of this process is also one of the most influential SF ever written in India. Originally published in 1905 in English, Roka Shekhavat Hussain's feminist utopia, Sultana's Dream, was translated into Bangla by the author herself in 1922, and again recently included in Konkabuti, the one that I referred to. In March 2021, it came out as a short Urdu animation in Pakistan, directed by Amne Shaikh Faruqi, and is now trending on social media among global SF communities for the last couple of days. So that's, that's, that's a great example of how we can see Indian SF transcend national and language barriers. However, we also need to be wary of the problem of representation, especially when transmitting locally specific values as a national marker to a global audience. A recent social media debate regarding an upcoming book of Indian English SF targeted at the Western audience came, comes to mind. The issue was not the stories, but the cover of them, which showed Goddess Kali in a robotic guise with the name of the book written in Bangla script along with English. I became aware of the um, debate very fairly recently, so did not participate in it. Um, the main point of the controversy was whether associating Indian SF, which is supposed to look to the future, with its mythical and orientalist past is justified. So that's a valid question, but answering such a question is not, ne not necessarily simple. There is no doubt that transmission and translation of Indian SF should not feed the appetites for already established stereotypes, in this case, religion and myth, Yet, we cannot disregard that fact that a considerable number of Indian SF still engages with imageries and imagination that has given rise to such stereotypes. Thus, such activities as 
editing and publication of Indian science fiction and translation and transmission of those things happen on a fraught ground that needs to be negotiated very carefully. Hopefully such controversies as this one will be limited only to the more peripheral matters as book covers and will not affect what is inside. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Suparno Banerjee, which has been a wonderful presentation. And from both the presenters of this session, we have received a lot of information on Indian and South Asian science fiction. I have learned a lot personally, and I think we are a bit late. Uh, but uh, uh, if we can manage a few minutes uh, for some questions, it will be very nice. I, I uh, believe there are questions, especially the students are uh, very interested in science fiction and they have questions for both the speakers. So if there is any, we can have a few questions from the floor. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, and just, uh, just, uh, I want to have information from Professor Borbuli. Uh, yes, I want to uh, have some idea about uh, the science fiction scenario in Assam, Assamese language. Uh, what's happening there? And if there are critical uh, discussions, books, uh, etc. Uh, uh, if you can uh, give us some idea, I'll be very, very, very benefited. And to Professor Bannard, uh, I would ask, I would have just, uh, I would like to know whether, as you rightly pointed out, it's really difficult to uh, have uh, access to the Bhasha literature uh, simply because you don't know many languages. Uh, can the language department in the university can take some uh, kinds of uh, uh, measures in, in, in encountering this kind of a problem? Because uh, bodies like national bodies like Shaito Academy or similar other bodies, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're limited in resources probably and cannot reach uh, equally well to different parts of the for that matter. So will that be uh, uh, if certain kinds of actions are taken at the ground level? Uh, will that be helpful? These are the two questions I ask. I okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in the context of Assam, like there are certain journals like Prantik, for instance, and there used to be another one, which is known as Mosak, where they, you know, at times, it's very, very, I would say, sporadic. They come out with a few uh, science fiction narratives, but it's not that common. And uh, Professor Suparna Banerjee, he mentioned about Lakshmi Nandan Bora's connection. So uh, that is one where you come across a few science fiction narratives uh, but otherwise uh, science fiction narratives in SMS context is sir, not that wrong or proliferating okay. okay thank you if i if i may add quickly there's also uh, dinesh chandra goshami translated works of dinesh chandra goshami uh, published um, by nbt and it's a work it's called uh, hair timer and that's a wonderful book okay so I was not aware of that. I actually tried to teach myself to read as a research doing the research for that book and obviously not completely successful. <laughs> um, so may I go ahead and answer uh, Professor Lahiri's uh, 
question. Please, Professor Banerjee, go along. We are running behind of time. And... So I, I think any any sort of help at any level will uh, will be really useful in this context of uh, learning about the the various um, science fictional um, traditions in India. And you probably are in a better and uh, or maybe Professor Bordley are in a better position to say about what's going on in the Indian academic context. But um, I think recently there has been quite a lot of effort uh, that I talked about regarding translation and many of these uh, magazines and journals and publication houses are showing interest in engaging in translation. So I, I probably see that as a more viable avenue because, you know, when it has to go through institutions, there are lots of <laughs> things that you have to take into consideration. But obviously the professors and teachers in those institutions can definitely help in propagating or um, pointing the students and readers in the right directions. I, that's that's what I think regarding this specific issue of transmission and translation. Yes, translation is a very politicized industry for translation and publication industry. So it's really uh, rather it's rather difficult to find proper translators and a publication house that is ready to translate the Indian Bhasha science fiction into more common used commonly used languages. But uh, I think we need to uh, put up forth our efforts uh, in whatever capacity we can. So Professor Himadri Lahari's proposition is, is very important that uh, the science fictions written in Indian Bhasha literatures, uh, translation of these very important and uh, whatever can be done in this regard in whatever capacity we can. Um, uh, so uh, I would uh, now go to uh, Mosumi Dash madam if no, uh, she has uh, there is another question uh, from a student Arindam De. Uh, he wants to know why does sci-fi focus more on dystopic future uh, than ideal utopian illusion? This is perhaps to Professor Bordoloi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think because uh, that is that has been the template like, since the time of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or the Last Man, or then uh, if you think about great you know science fiction narratives, most of them have been dystopian. 1984, Brave New World. New World. So I, I don't know what, but I think the, the writer's imagination are wetted more by the idea of an apocalypse or you know, a dystopian future. And I think I, I, most of it, I think it's a perpetuation of that Western model. Uh, maybe like uh, some uh, sir or Superna, uh, Professor Superna Banerjee would like to add something to this. Uh, yes, I, I can quickly uh, mention something, but I think this cannot be answered very quickly. <laughs> it's, it's a big debate. And I would say science fiction is not dystopian only. There are many forms that exist. Um, certain elements at certain points probably highlight the dystopian aspect. And I think um, Professor Baudelaire rightly pointed out many elements that are making contemporary science fiction dystopian. Um, there are others that often leads towards the dystopian imagination, but we have had utopian science fiction, again, depending on where this is happening, where the science fiction works are coming out of. Um, I briefly mentioned uh, um, Sultana's dream earlier. There are lots of utopian writing that came out in the middle of the 20th century in, in the Western um, traditions, is in Ursula Le Guin's works, uh, 
I, I would also say um, Delaney, Samuel Delaney's works often deal with this sort of uh, imagination. Um, Vandana Singh's, many of Vandana Singh's works, I do see a certain uh, strands of utopianism, not in the classical sense, but utopianism. But there, then you have like great communist utopias, like in um, Ev Ivan Yefremov's Andromeda, or um, Rahul Sankritan's Bais Visadi. So it's it's not one thing. There are many many aspects um, that science fiction deals with, but um, I think specific times and social environmental and other elements make works dystopian but to get into those i think we need a lot more maybe a completely different um, session or a webinar perhaps exactly uh, there are socio-economic uh, realities which the writers write and perhaps the dystopia arises from the social reality, especially in South Asia. When you don't have you know, food, proper food, you can always imagine a space where there will be a lot of food, but the human beings are not able to eat. So this kind of uh, imagination may work in that sense, because you know in reality you don't have food. Uh, but I have a specific question for both of you, since you have mentioned Rukia Sakawat's um, uh, Sultana stream, and since then I have uh, been referred to Konkabuti Kalpa Vigan Lekheni. Uh, why do you think there is a huge gap in women's science fiction, especially in Bengal? What can be the reason? I can attempt to answer this. <laughs> question but I know don't know if I'd be successful um I I think um, it this is probably similar to science fiction writing in general where women have written science fiction but maybe not in that large number but it could very well be the fact that the specific kind of educational parameters like women go more towards like the humanities where men going towards scientific education that could have been one issue that have plagued most science fiction writing scenario but the people have written uh Lina Lina has Lina. written science fiction during the throughout the time enaki chattopadhyay has written science fiction but again, that goes to show there are not a lot of names that we can come up with. There are others. I, I remember, I think Bondita Pukan uh, wrote in Assamish uh, maybe a little later, later, uh, 80s or something. But, but there are other authors who have written. It's not like that there are no, but towards the uh, um, Towards the second half of 20th century, we start seeing a lot more women actually writing. Um, but I, I think, again, my my insight is not very new or anything in, in this specific context. But I think it's similar to the rest of the world, um, where men probably took more interest in this science-based writing, which was the earlier incarnation, whereas um, the utopian uh, qualities were explored a lot more um, scantily, I would say. That could be one. Yes, thank you. Uh, Professor Gordon, what do you have to say in this regard? Well, I'll go exactly along uh, <laughs> what Professor Suparna Banerjee has said. I think it's basically you know, a state of mind, a state of consciousness. Uh, which perhaps, you know, we, I, I, it will be a very, I think, stereotypical answer to give. I think women are perhaps, you know, more interested or more attuned towards the humanities than towards exact sciences. And perhaps that may come for the reason. Uh, but there are plenty of, I think, uh, exceptions where you do come across, you know, many women writers who have written excellent science fiction like Rukmini Bhaya Nair, for instance, Manjula Padmana, uh, but why it's uh, perhaps, you know, conspicuous by its absence in 
in the you know in ASMIS or Greek context. Like I am not in a position to answer that query. Uh, thank you very much. I, I have been reading Lila Mujumdar and I found that she has been into uh, Indian meats more than into science in that kind of science fiction um, she has written. Uh, so uh, I was rather curious about it and perhaps it's not your field of interest. That's why. Um, but maybe it can open an avenue for new researchers. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think we, sh we can pack it up now. And, um, Madam, do you have any questions at your end? No, it's OK. Uh, okay. There is someone. Nearly shortcut, please uh, come forward. Madam Piali Sharka, have you any questions? I think uh, there is no such questions, ma'am. No, Piali Sharka has something to say. Yes, uh, we can hear you. You are audible. Please go ahead. Yali, madam. Please go ahead. Uh, my Can I go ahead and uh, address that quickly and then we, uh, yes. give the uh, floor to Professor Bordoli? Um, one easy answer is yes. <laughs> and I would say it all already does. It never completely followed the Western tradition. It, it, it constantly reinvents, constantly hybridizes, constantly brings in newer aspects that were that are not present in the Western framework. But it also often follows the Western framework. So um, again, uh, for me, it's a long way of answering things. But I have tried dealing with exactly this question in, in my book, earlier part of my book, long chapter on <laughs> of that book where I try to answer this question, like what is science? What are the different ways of utilizing knowledge systems? And I think uh, Professor Bordoli mentioned Amitabh Ghosh is the Calcutta chromosome. That's an excellent example, which goes beyond Western paradigms of science and science fiction. But there are many others. You, can, you just need to look at, you don't need to look beyond Professor Shonku narratives. There, there you have the questioning of Epistemolo question of epistemological frameworks and how to utilize that. What is science? What is not science? Um, constant conflict and confluence of all these epistemological traditions. But I think um, I'll just let uh, Professor Bobbilo uh, talk about that. Uh, well, I think it is possible and I think it's being done. In fact, the four narratives that we touched upon today, I, I basically dealt with narratives that did not explicitly you know follow the western model and uh, it it was more related to you know exploring issues of you know identity and uh, let's say politics uh, environmental issues uh, which is specific to the particular speciality of southeast asia so not southeast asia let's say southeast asia 
so i think so, even if you read uh, these two volumes uh, golan's book of you know science fiction south asian science fiction you will come across plenty of narratives by writers across asia yeah. where they try to know a subvert turn model and that's why i said that there is a sense of mimicry and that sense of mimicry involves both imitation as well as subversion subversion of the western frame well there's a little bit of you know imitation as well uh, uh, so i think it's possible and writers are already doing that i think that's a very good answer when you are referring to mimicry uh, and as well as you know, going beyond the framework of the west in science fiction because in your uh, presentation you have referred to the indian uh, pakistani and uh, sri lankan science fiction which the the reality of which is not actually uh, any i don't think is following the uh, western tradition of science fiction uh, where and when the indian science fiction folk is focusing on the partition uh, the other um, uh, one you mentioned and uh, professor suparna banerjee uh, we haven't read uh, the bhasha literature uh, science fictions in, in in india uh we uh, expect that there are many things that the west needs to uh, i think discover in these uh, writings so i i am happy that uh, people are coming forward to discover these things and i know particularly i know bodhisattva who is a very good friend of mine who is working on uh, science fiction in india and also yeah, creating a huge network on uh, his new project co futures um, i'm very happy and i i really think that the future of science fiction of south asia is really bright um and with this as you know uh, i'd like to end the session but before that i would go back to professor himadri lahiri uh, the person uh, sitting here all of us um, uh, respect him a lot i think himadri da will say the words in this session himadri da you thank you sabia but uh, i don't know any much about science fiction i learned that in the process of listening to all and therefore i am not the final person to say anything about that but uh, Yes, uh, uh, you know that uh, this field, as they, uh, this has been read by youngsters for a long, long time, out of their own interest. Science fiction, I mean. Uh, but now uh, there are good scholars who are coming out and writing about science fiction from different points of view, and that is that is very encouraging. So. I learn from you, and I will. I, I will also try to uh, have some idea about science fiction uh, in future properly. Uh, I don't have anything more to add. Thanks everybody for uh, offering your ideas, and uh, I'm like others. I'm also. Uh, I gather a lot of information from you, and the uh, way is. Uh, science fiction, fictional works are being uh, analyzed these days. Huh? Okay, thanks a lot. Ki. Ha ha, acha acha. Are the one or two? No, it's okay. The lectures delivered by your eminent scholars are uh, resource persons are really enlightening for us. And now, I'm not even listening. I'd like to end up the program. Along with conveying uh, my regards and thankfulness to the respected and reputed uh, resource persons and the prestigious chair persons, whose presence has heightened the elegance of our program. And really, we feel honored to have you with us. And I also, it remains. impossible uh, an impossible incomplete it remains incomplete without conveying thankfulness to my dear faculty members 
uh, on my department and my other colleagues from other departments and our honorable principal ma'am and the members of IQSC and above all I would like to convey my thankfulness to the participants, the professor, the research scholars for being with us and for their patient hearing. So it's okay ma'am. I would like to close here with your kind permission. Thanks Thank a lot. You so lot. Much. And good night. Okay. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.